Can we have the choir come up, please? Everyone help us sing tonight. As he brings the message this morning, I, uh, this evening, I just pray that you'd give him the words you'd have to say, Lord. I just pray that you'd touch our hearts. May we take something from the message tonight and apply it to our lives. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's try number 70. 70. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see.
Good evening and welcome back tonight to Tri-State Baptist Temple. We're excited to be back tonight. Uh, we're thankful for the good services we had this morning. It's always a blessing uh, to see someone baptized who has accepted Christ and now joined our church. And Danny's been with us coming for a long time now, so we're excited about that. And we're just looking forward again to another good uh, night in God's house. We just want to remind you about a few things uh, tonight. We'll remind you again that our Hallelujah Festival is coming up on October the 23rd. And right after the service tonight, just for a few minutes, we'll have a short uh, just organizational meeting and uh, try to uh, get some plans together so that we can be well prepared for that. We'll have uh, a lot a lot of things to do on that night to make sure everything is going well so we can just use everybody's help that's here tonight. We hope you'll encourage you to stay and, and see uh, what you can do to be a help on that uh, night. It's always a, a fun time to see all the children come in. They'll be in costumes and uh, playing games and the youth group has a special uh, carnival that they put on, they're going to put on this year in the youth building for the kids and so uh, we just look forward to that and hope you'll uh, make plans to help us with that this year. Our joy group is going to Bob Evans Farm Festival on Friday, leave here at 8 o'clock and so uh, if you're part of our joy group I hope you'll mark that down and make plans to come with us uh, on Friday. Uh, this Saturday, then, is our next men's uh, uh, fellowship. We want to encourage all of our men that are here uh, to come and be a part of that. We'll meet at 8.30. Uh, we'll have a good breakfast, and we will uh, spend some time in God's Word. We'll uh, continue to just uh, uh, spend some time fellowshipping together in God's Word. The food's good, but the uh, Word of God is what's most important, and we uh, enjoy that time. We just want to encourage all of our men uh, to come and be a part of that. And uh, so just continue to pray, be praying for all these activities we have going on and just that the Lord will uh, use us so that we can uh, see people say, we can see Christians continue to grow in their faith. Uh, this time we'll ask our men to come. We'll take up tithes, offering, and faith promise this evening. All right, let's pray. Amen. Well, good evening again. It's good to see you tonight on Sunday evening. And on Sunday nights, we take up a little change offering that we use to set aside to support and supply the need for our summer camp that we have every summer for all the boys and girls. And uh, we'll do that again this coming year in June. And we go away there Monday through Friday to summer camp and just have a great week. And uh, we take up a change offering every Sunday night. We just ask people to see if you have a few coins in your pocket or in the bottom of your handbag and get them out and get them ready. And we take those up and just lay them aside. And God just blesses and multiplies that change and helps us to meet the needs that we have for our summer camp. And uh, the way we help, the way we take up that offering is we ask all the children that are in our service to come and help us. So uh, if you're here tonight, you boys and girls, come on up here and give me a hand, okay? Come on up, and what you're going to do is uh, Brother Doug here is going to give you a cup, and then you're just going to stand right in your spot. Everybody stay right up here, and we're going to pray together first, and then we'll take up our offering, okay? So everybody just grab a cup and stay right still. 
and we'll pray together. Now, after I pray, what we'll do is I'll ask everybody, if they have some offering, to hold their hand up. And if you see somebody with their hand raised, then you can go to them, and they'll put their offering in their cup, cup for you. And when you've gotten it all taken up, come back up here, and Doug will help you get it put in that big jug for us, okay? So let's pray together, and then we'll receive our offering. Lord, we thank you tonight for all these boys and girls that are here. Lord, we pray your blessings on them and their families. I pray that every one of them will come to know you as their Lord and Savior, know what a joy it is to live for you and to serve you. And uh, Lord, to grow up and have a home, Lord, that uh, is just built on the foundation of God's Word. And uh, Lord, where you are at the center of all that's there. And so we just ask, Father, tonight you bless the offering. Thank you for it. We just pray you bless it and multiply it. And make it, Lord, meet the needs so that we can minister to children and uh, just be an encouragement to them and help them come to know Christ as their Savior. And so, Lord, we'll thank you for the offering tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have some offering, hold your hand up and keep it up high. And our boys and girls will come by and they'll pick it up. Thank you, boys and girls, for helping us take up that offering. We look forward to camp uh, when summer comes around. Well, before uh, Pastor comes for us tonight, uh, we're going to have a special. Miss Lydia and Baylor are going to come sing for us.
thank you, ladies, and it's good to see everyone and enjoy the choir singing as well. And it's been a good day. Appreciate folks coming out again tonight, and uh, we're thankful for God's goodness to us. If you would like to take your Bibles, please open them up with us to the Old Testament, to the book of Proverbs again, chapter 29. I'm going to read two verses from chapter 29, and I'm uh, going to uh, deal with this question, what should a child of God do in an election year? On November the 6th, we'll go to the uh, places where we're allowed to vote, and uh, we can cast our vote for the highest office of the land. What a privilege it is to have a country where we're able to do that. And we encourage everybody that's old enough to, to, to cast a vote, to vote, be involved, in, uh, that, uh, and take the, make the most out of that opportunity. Uh, October 9th is the deadline to register to vote. So if you've never registered to vote, you want to do that by October the 9th and be ready and be prepared uh, when that day comes. Uh, Proverbs 29 and verse number 1. The Bible says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority... The people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And we'll stop right there. We're going to deal with a question today that you might ask yourself, or it might be a question that comes up in some situation or circumstances. What, what does a child of God do in an election year? Uh, as we face the questions that we have and we look at the opportunity that we have, what do we do? What do we handle and how do we handle that situation we're going to look at that here tonight. Let's have a word of prayer together and we'll, uh, we'll begin. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity we have to be here together in this church. Thank you for those who, Lord, have chosen to come tonight and to be here. And God, we count it a great privilege that we can live for you and we can serve you. Thank you, Father, for the people of this church that, uh, Lord, uh, are serving in the nursery, driving vans and buses, teaching Sunday school classes and children's ministries who... Lord, uh, are willing to take uh, part, Lord, as uh, trustees and, uh, Lord, just to help on committees and different things. And, God, we thank you for them. And, yeah. Lord, we thank you for all those who are uh, faithful attenders here at our church, God. We just pray you'll bless them and encourage them. Help us all, God, just to count it such a joy and a privilege to be able to do these things while we can. And, uh, Lord, we just uh, pray tonight for those who aren't able to get out and come to church and be here like they would like to be here. And, Lord, as we go by and we visit uh, our families that aren't able to come anymore, God, we just want to uh, be mindful of them and remember them. Uh, Lord, we just uh, ask God you bless them and draw close to them. And, Lord, help us, God, each of us, while we're able to redeem the time we have to live for you and to serve you. We pray now, fathers, we've opened up your word that will open up our hearts. God, help us to, uh, to know and to discern what we as God's people ought to do when we uh, are in a, a year like this year when, Lord, we'll uh, elect a, a, a man who will serve in the highest office of our country. Uh, Lord, we just pray that, Father, we'll uh, know what we are to do and how we are to be as your people. And so, Lord, we just ask, Father, that you would open up our hearts to your word. Help us be obedient to you. Uh, Lord, we just pray that God will be uh, what you would have us to be. Uh, Lord, we pray for someone who's come to church tonight, but maybe has never received you as their personal Savior. Well, we pray today they'll know and realize that today's the day of opportunity for them. That They must, God, receive you as their personal Savior. And God, be saved today. We just pray, Father, you'll work in their heart. And so, Lord, we'll commit what's going to be done into your hands. Thank you for this privilege again, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you'll notice again that second verse. I'll just reread it. It says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. If you want to mark the word wicked in your Bible, it means lawless. That's what this word means. It means lawless. The Word of God states here that a nation suffers when lawless people increase in their authority. There is a law that is higher than the laws of man. There is a law that's higher than human law. It's the law of God and His Word. It supersedes all other laws. It's a higher law. Government, 
human government was ordained by God. God instituted human government. He did it along with the home. He instituted the home and the church. All human government is subject to the higher power and authority of God. It's the will of God today that every man and woman, boy and girl, know Him as their personal Savior. That's the will of God for everyone. We know today it's God's will for His people to willfully submit their lives to to the authority of God's Word and His will. He wants every child of God to submit their life under the authority of God's Word, be led by it, and then to seek out and to, to, uh, to follow the will of God for their life. Uh, we believe tonight that it's God's desire for His people to walk led of the Holy Spirit. We're all to be Spirit-filled men and women of God if we know Him as our Savior. Whatever and whoever we might be, husbands and wives, we're to be Spirit-filled husbands and wives. Parents, we should be Spirit-filled moms and dads. Uh, Children uh, should be spirit-filled children. If you're an employer or an employee, be a spirit-filled employer or employee. If you're a teacher or a student, a civic leader or a civil servant, if you know Christ as your personal Savior and you're a citizen of this nation, God wants you to be a spirit-filled man or woman of God. When lawless people, people who do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior from sin, when people who have not submitted their lives to the authority of God's Word and His will, people who do not walk led of the Holy Spirit, but instead walk according to the spirit of this world, which is an anti-God spirit. When those people increase in authority and rise in increasing numbers to hold the offices of high government authority and are able to influence policy, then that nation's on the road to ruin from within. And that's what the Bible says when it says when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked or lawless beareth rule, the people mourn. Today is the National Pulpit Freedom Day. I mentioned that Wednesday night. National Pulpit Freedom Sunday is what an organization has set aside this day to be. There are approximately... 12 to 1,500 churches today who will record their sermons that will be preached from their pulpits and they're going to mail them in mass to the United States government. This has been something that's been done by some churches for the past five years. And uh, what they hope to do is to turn the ever-increasing application of an amendment that was made to the Constitution in 1954 led by uh, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson. This amendment is called the Johnson Amendment. We probably don't know much about that or hear very much spoken of about that. But what this amendment does is it limits the free speech of organizations who hold a 501c3 tax uh, exemption status with the government. There are 29 different types of tax exemptions that organizations and groups can hold under the United States government, 29 different types. Churches fall into the 501c3 organization. The Johnson Amendment affects only the 5013c designation of the tax exemption status. Doesn't affect any of the 29 others, just that one. And what this tax, what this, what this uh, amendment does is it states that an organization that holds that tax exemption status cannot endorse directly or indirectly or oppose any political candidate. And it only applies to that one particular tax exemption organization, that group, and the churches of America fall into that one group. And uh, the liberal interpretation of the Constitution that's being made with all these recent high court appointments Uh, With that, the amendment is increasingly being applied to issues or topics that the courts and government officials deem to be political issues. In other words, they're forcing the issue when it comes to churches on what is being preached and taught from the pulpit. If they deem an issue to be a political nature then they want to censor that church from preaching or teaching on that issue. If they deemed abortion and the sanctity of life to be a political issue, they would want to silence the pulpits on preaching 
on abortion or the sanctity of life. If they deem uh, the scriptural constitution of a marriage and a home of a man and a wife being a politically charged issue, they wish to silence a church on teaching or preaching on that issue. That's why this organization has created this interest in this and why they're, uh, why they're seeking to have that amendment repealed, overturned. You know, I, I'm not participating in that, haven't signed up. Our sermons today aren't going to be uh, sent in to the government uh, because uh, not that I don't believe the spirit of what, what they're concerned about. I believe that's a great issue of concern. You know, I, I believe today we must never reach a place in our nation where the First Amendment, the First Amendment states that we have the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of the press, as well as the right to assemble and petition the government. I don't believe that that should ever be uh, in any way censored or should any way be repressed. Every church has the right to decide what will be preached from its pulpit. And uh, every pastor and preacher has to realize tonight that what they're uh, ultimately accountable to is not the government, but they're going to be accountable to God for what they preach or what they do not preach. There is a higher power. There is a higher law. And I feel that I feel the, uh, the reason, uh, ultimately though, that it's unnecessary for a church uh, to take action on this is, is I don't believe it's the responsibility as a pastor or of a church to endorse or support any individual candidate for a political office or, or a political party. It's not what we're here to do. And there is no need to do that. With, with this understanding, the core matter when we come to an election, whether it's national or local, goes beyond a political candidate. It goes beyond uh, a political party. What's at question is the principles and, and the practices that every child of God should govern their life by. That's going to make the decision. That's what determines the real core of the matter. The problems our nation faces today are not problems that can be uh, solved by a political candidate or a political party. They're problems, as we looked at this morning, that can only truly be helped by a return to righteousness and godly principles and practices that we find in the Word of God, in the lives of God's people. There's got to be, again, a recognition of scriptural practices and Christ-honoring principles by the citizens of our nation electing leaders who will do the same. That's going to, that's going to get the job done. That'll make a difference. The only true hope of our nation is not in the election of new officials or the re-election of old officials, but in a revival of godliness and righteousness in our nation. That's what, that's what we need. I do believe this year's election will be pivotal in the future of our country. The foundations of our nation, what we have been, are already in jeopardy. And the course of what our nation is going to become in the future, I think, will by and large be set by what happens in this election. What are the people of God to do? How should we, how should we take part? You know, the question some people may ask is, who should we vote for? But it's not the questions we're going to answer. Those aren't the questions that are really important. The questions that are important is, who are we as God's people to be? Who are we to be? And based upon who we are and what we are in Christ, how should we live our lives? That's the questions that I think that we need to answer. And when we have those things settled, the rest of it will take care of itself. Yes. won't be an issue. I want to give you these things tonight. Number one, when we as God's people are in a year like this year where there are elections at the highest level, what, what are we to do? How are we to respond? Well, let me say, I believe it's no different this year than any other year. What we need to do as God's people, number one, is always see everything through the windows of Scripture. Always look at everything through the window of the Word of God. It doesn't matter what it is. It all should come back to how we see that issue through the Scripture. It's what we have to do. Issues, you know, that's what you're going to hear a lot about. That's what an election revolves around. Issues are debated and eventually decisions are, 
made by people based upon issues, and people prioritize issues differently. Social issues, of course, are hotly debated things, things, that, uh, things like abortion and religious freedoms and uh, the redefining of marriage in our country, uh, traditional issues like health care and uh, the, the deficit unemployment, uh, the size of the government, the military, always divisive things. Uh, issues divide political parties. They divide uh, between the liberal or the conservative, the left wings or the right wings. Political issues, though, should never, please listen, a political issue should never divide a child of God from the Word of God. I know people today, professing Christians, and it seems like when they walk in the voting booth, they completely disregard the Word of God and the clear and obvious teachings of God's Word when they punch that ballot. There can't ever be a division of the Christian and a separation from the commands and laws of the Word of God. There has to be a unity there in God's Word. And uh, we, cannot, we cannot divide that. Uh, political issues should not divide the child of God from the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, there the scripture begins in the first verse of that chapter by speaking about the last days, knowing that in the last days perilous times shall come. And the Bible tells us how we're to, uh, how we're to deal with these things. In verse 14 uh, or 13 it says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We see that at every level of our society. In fact, we come now to the point when we're facing who to elect in an election. It's not who we can vote for. It's who we can try to stop or stand against. It's not that we can really support anybody. But we have to try to have a voice and make a stand. And it's going to get worse and worse. What are we to do? Well, in verse 14 he says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Never depart from the truth and the teachings of the Word of God. Let the principles and practice of the Bible be the guiding light for you, whether you're standing in an election uh, polling uh, place and casting your ballot, whether you're sitting in the church pew, whether you're in the, uh, the confines of your home or on the job or wherever you are, you cannot divide yourself from the teachings and truths of God's Word. He says in that 16th verse, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What is it that exalts a nation? Righteousness. What is it that we need as a nation to, to sustain our nation and to keep us from falling into reproach and the judgment of God? Righteousness. Where will we find it? In the Word of God. But if we deny the Word of God and we turn away from the Word of God, and we are able to somehow uh, take that part of our life and set it aside and become politically motivated by the issues that surround an election, then we're headed for, we're headed for a bad place. These things cannot, cannot ever depart a child of God's life. We must continue to look at life through the windows of the Scripture. Every child of God is to submit themselves to the authority of God's Word over their life. Every child of God, every church is to structure themselves according to the scriptural polity and practice that we find in the Bible. We're not out to try to create or recreate what the church ought to be. We have a pattern for it. We're to follow the pattern. Yes. And we must not separate ourselves from these truths. The government does not tell the true New Testament local church who they are and what they are to do or how they are to do what God has instructed them to do. A child of God, a Christian, is to place their lives under the authority of God's Word. It's to God's Word that the Christian is to look to find what we ought to be. How we're to live, the principles that should govern our lives, the way we're to practice our faith. The answer to every issue of life is found in the Bible. Every issue. On what side of any issue a child of God should stand can be found if you'll carefully search the Scriptures. You'll find from the teaching of God's Word how you should look at an issue. A social issue, a traditional issue, 
a policy or whatever it might be. If you'll study the Word of God, God's Word will help you to see as we submit to its principles and practices how we should feel about that. Where should we stand about that issue? It's the Word of God that has to guide a believer's life. It's the Word of God that one day will hold us accountable before God. It's the Word of God when obeyed that will transform our lives into lives that are productive and pleasing to the Lord. To stand against the principles and practices of God's Word and to stand with a political issue, a policy, or a candidate who is standing against the principles and practices of the Word of God is to stand against God and His Word. We must never forget that we must always look at everything. We have to look at the world through the windows of the Scripture. Everything. I want you to think about the second thing. What should we be? How should we as God's people be in an election year or any year? Well, secondly, we ought to seek to make decisions based on the promises and principles of God and His Word. We have a choice or decision to make. We need to look to God's Word for the direction. In Psalm chapter 37, Psalm 37, I'll just read a couple verses there beginning in verse number 1 and Sometimes you need to read the whole chapter, and, uh, but it's, uh, it helps us as we see what God says here. He says, num- verse number 1, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land. Verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. We think about the child of God and And this year or any other year, we need to seek to make decisions based upon the promises and principles of the Word of God. The promises and principles of a passage of Scripture just like that passage of Scripture. You know, the the key to making the right decisions, any decision in life, is in being sure that we delight in the right thing. Here, the Word of God tells us that we're to delight ourselves in the Lord. The Christian's life is not to be lived to pursue things not what our life is to be spent on, but it should be spent in the pursuit of the Lord Himself, fellowship with Him, service and devotion to Him. These are the things that we should pursue with our lives. Verse number 4 speaks about delighting in the Lord. First of all, above all, that should be our first delight, not in pursuing the desires of our heart or our mind. Human understanding and human reasoning will lead you into a conflict with the will of God and the Word of God. Because your heart's deceitful and our flesh is corrupt and our human reasoning and our human understanding of issues and policies and decisions have to be made, it'll put us into conflict with the Word of God, the will of God. Verse number 5 speaks about committing our way unto the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3 gives you those great scriptures that so many of you have, are so familiar with. And it speaks there about trusting in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, and it will be health to thy navel and morrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. 
secret to the prosperity that God wants His people to have is not in politics or politicians. It's in pleasing the Lord and delighting in Him. And when we do that, God will bless our lives. He will honor His promises and His words. Biblical right and wrong must always take precedent over the matters of personal, social, and civic issues. We cannot turn aside from the right and wrong of Scriptures simply to cast a vote for some issue or political party. There are some things here I think they're important not to forget. Firstly, don't forget ever that personally a child of God, uh, don't forget God loves you. He has a love for your life. He wants you to prosper. He wants to provide for you in spite of the circumstances and situations of the world and the world system. He loved you and gave Himself for you. How could He who spareth not His only Son How can He not also freely give you all the things that you need for your life, for your family? Don't forget that and don't forget that God wants to lead you. Isaiah 58, 11 says, The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Personally, never forget the love of God and His promise to provide for you. But don't also forget that socially when it comes to the issues of society, life and lifestyles, death and the sanctity of life, marriage in the home, raising and educating children, all of those issues must be brought back to the Word of God and reconciled with what the Bible teaches. And that's where we want to stand on those types of issues. And when it comes to civic duty and service, people that hold political offices or participate in the election of governmental officials, we must do it based upon the principles of Scripture and the promises of God to please Him above all in what we do. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Whatever it is, we must do it for the glory of God. Uh, I'm I'm not going to vote for a candidate who simply promises to take care of my health, to provide me wealth, to preserve the environment of our planet, or to keep me safe. That's not the essential reasons why I'm going to give a candidate my vote. I I have to believe as a child of God, according to uh, the Scripture, like Matthew chapter 6 there in verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall ye eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As a child of God, I have to uh, never forget that God, uh, my Savior, is personally responsible for me. He's taken me uh, into His hands and promised to care for me and provide for me as my Heavenly Father. He's going to do that regardless of the circumstances or situations I find myself in, whether I'm in this country or anywhere on planet Earth. He's my Father and He'll provide my needs. I'm not looking to the government to do that. But I need to seek to further His kingdom before my self-interest and before the issues and associations of this world live for Him and please Him. And He said, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm going to cast my vote for those I feel that will, from their track record, advance or uphold policies that most closely agree with the Scripture and are not in direct violation of those things God says are an abomination unto Him or transgress the law of God. I have to do that as a child of God. I want to give you this last one just quickly. What should we do? We as God's people, not just in an election year, but any year. Well, look at everything through the window of Scripture. Seek to make decisions that reconcile with the Scripture. And then thirdly, serve the Lord and live that we might see souls saved. The answer to the great problems in our country are going to be seeing people saved. God's people revive to where God again is the center of hearts and lives and homes and so that the policy of our nation and the leaders of our nation once again are going to be placed into office by people with, that, that have and know the, the true and living God and, and have uh, at the heart core of their uh, desire to please the Lord. And that will change the course of our nation. The righteous again will rule. 
And that will make the difference. This world, this nation, is not the end all for the people of God. It's not it. It's not the end all. All men have eternal souls. Eternity awaits for all men. There's a heavenly home that I have where I'm going to spend eternity. We're pilgrims in this place, traveling through. We're, we're not, uh, we have a dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of the United States, but I'm a citizen of heaven. That's going to be my eternal home. And uh, some thing, someday this world and all that's in it are never going to be remembered again. And there's an eternal hell, though, that's also equally true, a lake of fire where the souls of the lost are going to suffer for eternity. Yeah. November 6th, important decisions will be made. most important decision anybody can make is what they're going to do with the Lord Jesus hey. Christ. Yes. What are you going to do with Christ as your Savior? That's what's going to mean to make the difference. In eternity, it's not going to matter who's the next president of our country. But what you do with Jesus Christ will make a difference. It's going to matter. And we as God's people can't ever stop living to please Him and reaching souls because ultimately that's the most important thing. The other things we'll be held accountable for, but that's the most important thing. Be sure that you know Christ as your Savior and we as God's people, we want to be looking at the world through the windows of the Word of God. We want to be making our decisions, having committed our life into God's hands, trusting His promises trusting his, his, his principles, living by them, and seeking to win souls and live for Christ. I think that's what we need to do, God's people, yes. this year or any other year. It would be that which would please God. Let's pray, let's pray tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In a moment we'll stand together and we'll have a verse of an invitation song. And There may be somebody who's come to church tonight who's never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. As you said in your seat today, you might say, Pastor, when I was young, I, I spoke to some person in authority in a church. I read a booklet. I made a statement. Uh, I was uh, catechized, confirmed. I was uh, baptized. I was sprinkled. Uh, I, I did some religious action but today, as I sit in my seat, I realize I've never repented of sin and received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I know tonight I need to ask God who loved me to forgive me for being the reason why He had to send His Son to suffer and die on Calvary's cross. I want to ask Him to forgive me, and I want to receive His Son Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection as enough to satisfy God on my behalf. And I'm asking Him to give me His righteousness as a free gift. Maybe you're here tonight. You need to receive Christ as your Savior. Whoever you are, I hope you'll slip out of your seat tonight and come. Don't be embarrassed by that. I promise you, anybody in here that knows Christ as their Savior, they're going to be rejoicing for you. And they're going to be praying for you. If you're here tonight and you say, I need someone to take the Bible, show me how I can be saved. You may be the youngest person in the building, a child, a teenager, an adult, mom or a dad, grandparent, whoever you are. If you're not saved tonight, I'm asking you, pleading with you, won't you come? Let us take the Bible to show you from the Scripture what you need to do to settle it tonight. Wouldn't it be good to leave here tonight knowing having it settled in your heart and life that you're saved, that you have Christ living within your heart and life, that now with Christ in you, that you can live a life that pleases the Lord. You can practice the principles of God's Word and submit your life to His authority. And God will, God will bless and help you and provide the needs of your life. I want to encourage you tonight. If you, if you need to know... Christ as your Savior. Slip out of your seat and come. People, people are praying for you. My wife will meet you. I'll meet you. Brother Evan will meet you. Somebody will take the Bible and show you from the Scripture how you can be saved. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't leave here tonight thinking, boy, I wish I would have. Because we have no promise of when this life is going to come to an end for us and we're going to enter eternity. Won't you come tonight? Let Christ do what He wants to do in your life. Let him save you tonight.
you. Here's God's people. I pray tonight we would just commit ourselves to the authority of God's Word. We would just surrender our life that we might view all things through the Scripture. We might make our decisions based on God's principles and practices. We might seek to win souls and to live for the Lord, knowing that ultimately that's what's going to make the difference. If you're here tonight and you're seeking a decision that needs to be made, choices that you have to make, be sure you reconcile those choices and decisions with God's Word because you'll never go wrong. But the lawless, those who will not submit to the Word of God, those, that, uh, those whose, uh, whose decisions and, and uh, the choices that they make are against the Word of God, those who harden their neck against the authority of God's Word, they'll suddenly be destroyed, the Bible says, and there's no remedy for that. I hope you'll seek the Lord tonight will be obedient people to Him. God may be speaking to somebody tonight about surrendering your life to serve Him or to live for Him. Maybe as a preacher, pastor, missionary, or evangelist, some young man, some young lady, Lord might be dealing with you about full-time Christian service. Maybe as a, a Christian school teacher or a missionary, a preacher, a pastor, an evangelist wife, whatever it is, the will of God might be for your life. Once you surrender your life to the Lord, put it in His hands. Let's pray together tonight. Father, we pray in Jesus' name you'd have your way. Help us to be people of God that live to please you. Spirit-filled men and women, young people, God, that surrender and submit our life to the authority of Scriptures, that, Lord, view all things, God, based upon the Word of God, reconciling every choice and decision we have to make, every issue that needs to be uh, decided on. Lord, may we bring those things back and see what thus saith the Lord. Seek your leadership and your guidance. Help us, Lord, to live for you and to serve you in these days that God the righteous, God, may shine like a light. And Lord, we're just praying, Father, that you'd bless tonight. Someone here this evening maybe needs to come and trust you as their Savior. Whatever the decisions need to be made, we just pray, Father, that folks will be, uh, Lord, open and honest with you, obedient to you. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, turn to him, but... Hymn 296 in our hymn book. The Lord's spoken to you in a specific way. We just want to invite you to say yes to Him. Uh, maybe you need to come and pray. Find a place you can to pray and seek the Lord and uh, allow God to do what He wants to do in your life. Maybe you're here tonight. You need to be saved. Just slip out of your seat and come. We'll meet you here and we'll find a place where we can discuss that with you. Well, let's sing that first verse together of hymn number 296. So Sing that second verse, verse 2. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Amen. Well, it's been a good place to be uh, today in God's house. We appreciate all uh, the good Bible uh, preaching we've heard today and the, uh, just uh, how it's an encouragement to us. I hope you'll be uh, not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word and allow it to affect your heart and uh, to follow these principles and 
promises that we have uh, in God's word. But we're going to finish up tonight. If you're going to help us with the Hallelujah Festival, we want to encourage you to do that. If you could just uh, come up here in the choir loft and we'll meet just for a moment after the service, that would be uh, helpful for us. So when we dismiss, just to head on up here in just a few moments, we'll get started with that. So uh, we encourage you to do that. But we'll be dismissed tonight with a word of prayer. Brother Chris, do you care to pray for us? Thank you. Yes. Amen.